Our scripture lesson this morning comes to us from the Gospel according to John, chapter 12, beginning with verse 20. Hear the word of God. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethesda in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out, but I when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all and everyone to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. This is the word of the Lord. Be will you pray with me? Our Lord, our God, we ask that you would write your word upon our heart as we listen this day. Help these words be your words that we might hear through the Spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. When I was growing up, my mom always told me, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Which is a lesson that so far has been fairly accurate in my life. I'm not suggesting that experience and education are not important, but in a clutch situation, many of our opportunities come from the connections and the relationships we have with others. This seems to be the case in our gospel lesson today. There were a gr group of Greek Jews that were on pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the Passover who want to see Jesus. So they reach out to the one who they know, or at least the disciple that is most familiar to themselves, the one with a Greek name, Philip. They were keenly aware that they would need someone on the inside to get an audience with Jesus. So they reach out to Philip, and they go to him and they say, we want to see Jesus. At that time, great crowds had come into Jerusalem to celebrate Jesus' arrival. They had heard all about the wonderful acts of healing and teaching that he had become famous for, and they all welcomed that arrival for the festival of Passover with great acclamation. Next Sunday, we will celebrate that acclamation in Palm Sunday. Jesus had arrived to all of these crowds who were waving palm leaves and carpeting the road with their cloaks so that Jesus could ride in triumphant. 
Now, many historians read back into this text tension and anxiety because we know in hindsight that Jesus will end up on a cross in a few short days. But in real time, in real time, when this is happening for the first time, only Jesus himself knew where this would be concluding. The rest of the disciples and the crowds had no reason to feel tension or anxiety yet. They were just feeling jubilant and triumphant. But the drama was mounting. Just six days before, Mary had anointed Jesus' feet in what we now understand as an act of preparation for his death and his burial. And then shortly before that, Jesus had wept at the death of his friend Lazarus, only then to display the full power of God's love to all that were present as Jesus raised his friend back into life. A time of wonder and a time of deep joy that was foreshadowing Jesus' own resurrection. No wonder everyone wanted to see Jesus. People were streaming into Jerusalem for the Passover and were eager to see this man of God named Jesus. Among the curious were some of the Greeks who had come to see Jesus. They were anxious to speak with him. And their arrival seems to spark a new sense of urgency in Jesus' heart. Jesus, in response to their request, says, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And then he exclaims, Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains but a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. At this gardening reference, the disciples must have been scratching their heads. The disciples assume that they are on the precipice of greatness, the inside men to one of the greatest coups in history. And then Jesus starts talking about dying wheat. On the surface, we would probably agree that one single diamond is worth more than, let's say, a single kernel of corn. If you put both away a diamond and a kernel of corn in a drawer for 100 years, the diamond would most likely increase in value and the corn would still be a kernel of corn. Even more so, the value of the diamond would increase over a thousand years, and yet the kernel of corn would still be a kernel of corn. But what if you put that kernel of corn in rich earth? One kernel would produce two or three, at least, ears of corn. And the corn those ears of corn would probably have two or three hundred kernels each. So then the next year, if you planted all those kernels, the next year you would yield a crop. Now, I know there's mathematicians out there that can do the math for me. I can't, but I know, like, it's massive, right? So in a hundred years and in a thousand years, the value of the crops produced by that one single kernel of corn would cause the value of that single kernel of corn to be way more than that single diamond. The diamond would pale in comparison. Jesus is comparing himself to that grain of wheat. His death 
to a grain sown and decomposed into the ground. And his resurrection, he is comparing to a blade which springs up from the dead grain. By dying, the grain bears much fruit. And by Jesus dying and being glorified, the fruit of the church is established. Jesus was the seed who would die so that the great harvest of fruit would become possible and the drawing in together of all people in his name, Jews and Greeks alike, would acknowledge the glory of God and the power in Jesus' name. And they, in turn, would follow him in faith and so on for the next generations to come. As believers, we are now that precious crop that has resulted from that single seed dying and rising again. Which leads me to a curious question. If those Greeks were to show up in our congregation today, would they be granted their heart's desire? We hear a lot these days about people in our society who describe themselves as spiritual, but not religious. Those who believe in God, or at least a higher power, but do not affiliate with any particular religious organization. If the spiritually curious came to our church, would they see Jesus? Now, before we get all defensive, or make excuses, we need to pay close attention to the details of the scripture. Interestingly, it's hard to know whether those Greeks actually got their wish. They came and they asked the question. They came to Philip and asked to see Jesus. And it sparked a response from Jesus. But we are actually not told whether they met Jesus face to face. Their question sets the transition for Jesus' passion, but John is unclear as to what happens to them. What John is very clear about, however, is the kind of Jesus they and we will see if we really look. Because upon hearing this request, Jesus immediately looks toward the cross. The hour he speaks about, the glory that he prays for, the fulfillment of his mission and his destiny he anticipates, all of this revolves around the cross. His obedient embrace of sacrificial love to the point of death. Which tells us, which tells us the faithful churchgoers and the unaffiliated quite a bit about this Jesus. The point of faith in Jesus isn't just faith or comfort or satisfying spiritual desires. No, the point of following Jesus is that we might be drawn more deeply into the kingdom of God through our love for, service to, and sacrifice on behalf of those around us. Jesus comes to demonstrate God's strength through vulnerability, God's power through what appears to be weak in the eyes of the world, God's justice through love, mercy, and forgiveness. He calls those who would follow him to the very same kind of life and love. Is this the Jesus the Greeks want to see? Is it the Jesus that we want to see? Perhaps or maybe not. But I do know that the Jesus who reveals the heart of our loving God by going to the cross is the Jesus that we get. And the Jesus who is raised again on the third day 
to demonstrate that love is more powerful than hate and life more powerful than death is the Jesus that we are called to serve and to share. It's all who you know. Amen.